Horror movies sucked. There was a time, before Miramax essentially cornered the market on the genre, when studios would put quite a bit of effort into what was referred to as their prestige picture. They didn't happen every year, and not every studio took part. The intention was to demonstrate to audiences all over the world that while some countries may occasionally get lucky and make a hit movie, the best of the best of any and all kinds of movies came from Hollywood, California. It didn't matter the genre. Hollywood ruled for decades, and one of the most significant ages of production remains the 80s. Not only was Hollywood still fairly experimental, trying new characters and stories presented by young, fresh, innovative, and eager filmmakers, brought up with traditional filmmaking principles, applied to their vision in ways that changed how movies were made forever. One of the most significant changes was the shift in focus from the importance of the prestige picture to the blockbuster. When corporations saw the money possible from one well-made movie, or better yet, the early stages of what could become a franchise, they started buying up studios, or, like Sony, started their own studio. And from there, with studios now beholden to shareholders far more interested in profit than prestige, the slow descent into the drivel slopped out these days became inevitable. Anyway, in the middle of this glorious transitionary period known as the 80s, the prestige picture was still very much a thing. It was something intended for audiences that wanted more from their entertainment than guns, boobs, and explosions, which is still a winning formula for any movie in my book. But these were different, intended to be more focused artistic, not simply entertaining, but also thought-provoking, with cinematic images, music, and performances that, at its best, demonstrated the unforgettable potency of cinema. The prestige picture was intended to be appreciated as much for the craftsmanship that went into it as the experience of viewing it. While the goal was to cement a studio's reputation, it was not necessarily expected to be a huge money-making blockbuster, which is also why corporate-owned studios have pretty much abandoned this production model, despite the long-term value and rewatchability of these movies. Whenever I hear a phrase like, you can't make a movie like that these days, or they'd never let you put that in a movie now, the owners behind the studios are where my mind goes, and I curse their cowardice. So, here we are in the 80s, and Harrison Ford was looking for something that would help break him out of the Han Solo, Indiana Jones identities that audiences seem to love and adore. For him, he wanted to show some emotional depth and elevate his reputation as an actor. He wanted his own prestige picture. Now, in those days... Studios paid attention to audiences. They understood that ticket sales increased when they presented movies audiences wanted to see. If the movie bombed, they didn't blame the audiences for not liking the movie. Instead, they made a different movie if they could. So, if one of the most profitable, popular actors of the time says he wants to do something different, something respectable and prestigious, well... Studios paid attention. They searched for the best director for the best project that would highlight the best quality of cinema studio dollars could create. They did this as much for their audience as they did for themselves. These were the days when the Academy Awards, the coveted Oscars, still meant something outside the 30-mile zone. So in 1985, Harrison Ford led audiences on another adventure to a world never really seen before. But he wasn't flying through space fighting aliens. He wasn't exploring ancient ruins or fighting Nazis in foreign lands. No, this time he was a big city cop, jaded by experience who finds himself in the middle of a conspiracy that not only threatens him, but a single mother and her son who happen to find themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. The boy, played by wide-eyed first-timer Lucas Haas, is witness to a murder. During the course of the investigation, it's revealed that the murderer is actually another cop, and suddenly Harrison Ford's character, Detective John Book, realizes that not only will this case never get solved, the lives of this innocent mother and child are in immediate danger. And, to add a little extra spin to the story, the mother and son are Amish. She is recently widowed, and they had to travel into the big city to handle some legal stuff, but otherwise, the Amish have a very devout religious lifestyle, and they deliberately do not mix with the rest of the world. Their lives are effectively a time capsule, no electricity, no combustion engines, they're farmers and builders, but they keep to themselves as much as possible to avoid corrupting what, to them, is an idyllic lifestyle.
What does it mean to be a good person, uphold the law, and enable justice? What kind of person do you have to be to put yourself in harm's way, deliberately, willingly, to protect the innocent? This is the opening premise of Witness, Peter Weir's immaculate, captivating, and even haunting movie starring Harrison Ford and an as-yet-unknown Kelly McGillis. I say this is the opening premise because, in a desperate attempt to protect mother and son, Detective Book drives them back to their home, where he succumbs to injuries from an earlier confrontation with the bad guys. Here, the movie shifts from a gritty murder mystery to a fish-out-of-water romance. Two lovers doomed to forsake each other because, despite how real their attraction may be, the worlds they live in are too separate, too far apart in too many ways to allow for this romance to grow beyond this brief moment they share. You see, the elders in the Amish community aren't thrilled about this stranger in their midst, but they understand that by helping him, they are helping the mother and son one of their own, so they agree to allow Detective Book to stay with them while he recovers. Now, to be honest, the themes don't really change all that much, but become layered, lulled into the background, deliberately ignored until those moments where our characters are confronted by the harsh truths within the answers to these questions. As John Book recovers, he learns more about the Amish people and this idyllic world they cling to so steadfastly. Lacking modern conveniences, it is easy to dismiss these people as simple and somehow lacking in their lives for how they choose to practice their faith. Through John, we learn more about the Amish and gain insight not only about the quiet strength of these farmers and craftsmen, but we are given a sense of the allure of their lifestyle and their faith. Call it a fateful romance, one we can all see is doomed from the start but must inevitably grow and blossom in its own way, as does any ill-fated flower. This is one of Harrison Ford's greatest performances. For me, it's his best. He goes through so many experiences and emotions authentically. There's no swagger or bravado. The passion that grows between him and Kelly McGillis, her first major role before Top Gun, is subdued restrained, unlike the brash, reactionary, and ultimately fatal passions of Romeo and Juliet, this romance between mature adults simmers. So much is exchanged in a glance between these two that you can see how contemporary cinema is undermined by a dependence on spoken dialogue. But we as humans, observing this authentic moment, understand in a way that makes words unnecessary. The relationship between Harrison Ford and Kelly McGillis exemplifies this. We see how their relationship moves from professional to polite, their courtesy and curiosity growing into attraction, allowing themselves to get as close as they can without crossing the one strict rule between them. The one brief moment of dialogue that Harrison speaks to her, defining what they both know to be true, is perfect because it answers all the unspoken questions, settles all of the conversations we witnessed but never actually heard. That is the power of cinema. One thing this movie is known for is the barn-raising sequence, a beautiful montage of the Amish community coming together to construct a new barn from scratch. Harrison Ford's self-taught carpentry skills added to the overall authenticity of the sequence, but it's the cinematography that captures the beauty of the Amish countryside, an attractive and idealized landscape in stark contrast to the more familiar noise and anxieties of our contemporary lives. The differences between these two worlds remind us that John Book is merely a guest, as he recovers, as their romance grows, the world continues to move against them. It all comes to a head when the bad guys show up with guns intent on forcing these peace-loving people to submit. The fish out of water, the man between two worlds, finds himself the defender of the innocent, demanding justice, confronting evil with righteous indignation against the powers that would corrupt and exploit for their own desires to profit at the expense of others. It's over enough! Enough! One man, standing for the betterment of all, standing for a higher ideal. One man, standing up and winning. This is what an American hero used to be.